Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Mr. Stephen Bradley. Stephen works at the intersection of technology, security operations, and policy to advance U.S. national cyber defense. He has over 20 years of experience managing the development and application of advanced data analytics solutions to support a variety of national security missions, including cybersecurity, through his work at the Department of Energy National Laboratories. He has also led cyber threat intelligence teams engaged in threat analysis, attack simulation, and threat hunting. In July 2020, he became the director of the newly formed Cognitive Security Intelligence Center, and in August of this year, he published a paper through the Carnegie Endowment Partnership for Countering Influence Operations entitled, Securing the United States from Online Disinformation, a Whole of Society Approach. Stephen Bradley, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Hi, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to uh, being on your podcast. Well, we are excited to have you. And I'd like to start, if see if you could please give our audience a little bit more background about your career and how this led up to being the lead for the newly formed Cognitive Security Intelligence Center. Great, yeah. So it's uh, it's been a little bit of a journey, um, as you as you pointed out in my introduction. I spent a number of years working at Department of Energy National Laboratories, and about uh, twenty years ago, in the wake of the nine eleven terrorist attacks, I was leading a uh, a team of uh, software developers, data scientists, um, doing some innovation in large scale information fusion. Um, which is essentially applying technologies like graph technologies, text analytics, uh, visualization technologies. And at the time, we were pretty novel, and we were uh, attempting to provide uh, capabilities to uh, largely the, the uh, national security sector within the federal government. And again, in the wake of 9-11, our focus was on counterterrorism intelligence analysis. Um, did that for a number of years um, and was very exciting, uh, but I would say over time, uh, those technologies became less uh, innovative and began to be commercialized or, or commoditized in open source libraries. If you think of things like Palantir, if you think of things like Neo4j, um, uh, again, the technologies were kind of uh, moving out into the commercial and open source space. So about 10 years ago, I pivoted away from that innovation and focused more on uh, a mission application, uh, especially in the area of cybersecurity and cyber threat intelligence. Um, and again, it was very similar. It was akin to correlating large amounts of, of data, looking at indicators of compromise and cyber attacks, and correlating them and clustering them to figure out you know, were campaigns uh, related, were there act actors all working in concert, um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, while I worked in that capacity, I managed threat intelligence teams, as you pointed out, and I was working with and supporting um, ISACs, information sharing and analysis centers. And that's largely how I ended up where I am today. Um, kind of thinking about the run up to the 2016 election, um, I was, uh, like, like many people, I was an avid user on social media. Um, and I could tell something was changing. Something was, was kind of wrong. Um, you could see the rapid decline in the communities and you could tell that things are becoming much, much more divided. And at first, you know, I kind of chalked this up to a natural behavior, uh, you know, human behavior. Um, but of course, then his attention started turning towards foreign meddling in the election, uh, immediately realized of this uh, national security threat. Um, so we now know that you know, propaganda is nothing new, but social media has really clearly become a game changer. If you think about the speed and the scale that disinformation can propagate, if you think about the potential to do your, uh, your targeting and reach the audiences that will be most divisive, um, it really has changed the nature of propaganda. Um, and so as I thought about the solutions to that kind of problem, 
I kind of thought back to my, my time in cyber threat intelligence and working with ISACs and started to think about how could an ISAC be used to, to drive solutions to, to this particular problem of online disinformation? Yeah, that's great. Um, I think it might be helpful for our audience if you could tell a little bit more about what an ISAC is and uh, how, how that fits into the, the, the discussion. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so um, I guess it was late 1990s. Um, there was a presidential directive that mandated um, each of the U.S. critical infrastructure sectors uh, to create a sector-specific organization explicitly for the purpose of sharing security information. Uh, it was a growing concern at the time that uh, certain critical infrastructure sectors could be victims of cybersecurity attacks and the um, collective security approach where you have the private entities within those sectors all collaborating and sharing threat intelligence um, would certainly help them protect themselves better. Um, those ISACs over time grew, and I believe there are 16 or 17 critical infrastructure sectors, mostly managed and overseen by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and they've matured over the last decade. Uh, some of the more prominent ones include uh, ISACs supporting financial services, energy, election infrastructure, and um, there's the Health ISAC, which was uh, started by Deborah Koza, who's the president of my parent organization. Um, again, mentioned that the historical uh, focus has largely been on cybersecurity. Some of the ISACs have been expanding into physical security. And with Deborah Cobes' vision and others that I've reached out to, like Rand Waltzman, um, they see the need to push this beyond cyber and physical alone and to push into what we call cognitive security, uh, given the interplay between all three of those components. And so that connection between cyber, physical, and cognitive security is largely what drove uh, the creation of the Cognitive Security Intelligence Center. Um, again, our view is that given the interplay, it's important to take an all hazards view of the threat landscape. Fantastic. So let's, let's move over into the article that you re recently got published as part of uh, a Carnegie Endowment Partnership Initiative for Countering Influence Operations. So the title, and we'll have a link to this in the show notes, is Securing the United States from Online Disinformation. And you assert that a whole of society approach is needed. Can you talk to us about that article? What drove you to write the article and uh, you know, some of your recommendations? that are contained within the article. Oh, absolutely, yes. So um, again, my, my experience working with ISACs in the cyber world um, is what kind of got me started thinking about that as a potential solution. But as I peeled back the onion a little bit more and started thinking about um, how an ISAC operates and you know what those cyber threats look like, um, I realized that it can be applied immediately to disinformation and misinformation, um, but, there's some key differences that need to be addressed as well. Um, you know, cognitive security threats is all about hacking people, hacking minds, which is rather different from hacking uh, cyber systems. And so I wrote that paper largely to uh, shed some light on what I thought some of those key differences were um, and to really invite, uh, you know, some of the thought leaders in this area to engage in conversations about how we might solve some of those key differences. And then I suggested, uh, uh, a couple of um, uh, solutions to those those differences that I saw. Right. So w when I think of cognitive security, I I think about information operations, which ultimately target the human brain and uh, eventually attempt to uh, tarnish decision making or to uh, sway or or uh, drive decision making in a direction which favors the attacker, whether the attacker is a, a nation state or a, a rogue actor, the ultimate goal is to affect the human cognition. So can, can you talk a little bit about the, the interplay between you know, cybersecurity, cognitive security, and you know, how you see some of those uh, uh, differences playing out in the information space? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, we all think about um, 
what happened in the 2016 election, at least part of what happened. We think about the DNC hack. We, um, we know that that had a cyber component. Um, uh, the DNC systems were hacked, information was taken and then leaked out to uh, ostensibly to uh, to WikiLeaks. And so, you know, that clearly has a very strong cyber component to it. Um, but there are obviously many other kinds of ways to engage in um, cognitive threats or information operations um, uh, in ways that don't always involve cyber or cybersecurity. And so there were three um, differences in particular that I, I thought about and, and, and wanted to write about in this Carnegie paper. Um, I, guess, I guess the first difference I would look at is um, what I would call capacity. Uh, if you think about the cybersecurity industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry with, with an absolutely huge market for tools and technology training, certification and whatnot. Uh, if you think about things like the RSA conference and all the corporate support they get, um, you know, it really sheds a light on the size of that market. Um, cognitive security, by comparison, in my view, will always be much, much smaller. Um, and that, that tends to make it difficult to drive innovation, technology innovation, uh, makes it more difficult to advance uh, the analysis and response tradecraft, um, and it's just in general to develop the workforce. And so one of the things that um, I'm advocating and, and I'm pushing for through our intelligence center is uh, to collaborate with academic centers of excellence. We know who the some of the key players are in this space um, to essentially work with them to to bring some new tools and uh, innovations and emerging capabilities into an operational environment to serve as kind of an experimental platform. Um, we'd also like to work with them to jointly develop uh, training programs and, and, and establish interships, uh, internships. And so that really sets us apart from many of the other ISACs and going that extra extra mile and making sure that we build capacity in this space. There's actually a second second difference that I, I see, and um, that is um, what I call the ability to assess the threat. Um, if you think about cybersecurity, um, they have uh, a wealth of frameworks and guidelines from things like the cyber kill chain, uh, the MITRE attack model, uh, the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. And these are all great tools that, that allow cybersecurity analysts to have common conversations about the risk or the threat or the vulnerability. And, and, and that's, that's very helpful as a community to have that kind of capability. We don't have that capability yet today in the cognitive security community. Um, there are some people doing some really great work in this space, Sarah Jane Turr, Pablo Brewer, um, and they, they, they've taken uh, the MITRE attack model for cybersecurity and they, they've gone to extend it for cognitive security. And they've made some great progress, but um, we're not really at the place where that's been widely adopted by the community. And uh, the Intelligence Center on Lending will absolutely want to get behind that effort. Uh, but success would require uh, a high degree of community adoption so that we have that common approach to, to, to fighting this fight. So when you also think about... Uh, uh, excuse, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. excuse me, interrupt. What, what, was that, what was that model that you just mentioned? So that's called the, the ATT&CK model, A-T-T-A-C-K. That was developed by MITRE, and it was really a way to put a framework in place to talk about uh, cyber threat actor uh, TTPs and ways to drive decisions about response actions. I thought that you had mentioned a you know a early cognitive security model or an attempt to uh, uh, scope scope the cognitive security threat. Well, one of the things I was going to mention is. Um, I think one of the ways we need to use a model is to to be able to think about what the risk is of of um, a particular cognitive threat and, and and understand you know how much attention how much energy do we as, as as a nation need to put into it and so if I think about just you know the core definition of um, you know malign influence or disinformation um, you think about the, the the large number of ways that 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 can manifest itself. And, you know, I come up with some examples. Uh, some of your listeners may be familiar with the fire festival of a few years ago. There have been a couple of documentaries uh, that talk about that. And, you know, basically it was a social media advertising campaign to entice thousands of, of music fans to attend a festival in, in the Bahamas. And it was largely overhyped. It turned out to be a, a multi-million dollar fraud 
and arguably a short-term health hazard. Uh, but if you think about an example like that, it's clearly disinformation. But you know, what is the risk? Who are the victims? And and you know, how do we go about thinking about is that something that someone like our intelligence center should address? And so, without having frameworks to come up with a taxonomy of threat actors and objectives and techniques and whatnot, um, it really becomes quite difficult. And you'll find that you know, one organization talking about cognitive security threats might be looking at something very different from another. Right. And that, uh, that fire festival for, for the audience, there's a, you know, uh, astonishing, um, documentary. I think it's on Netflix or something to check it out. It's a uh, pretty, pretty amazing how, how all of that went down. Yeah. And I think I, I could rattle off a number of other examples that of ways that disinformation kind of uh, creep into society and, you know, are, are, are probably not appropriate for, um, some, you know, an organization like mine to address. And, and what I advocate in the Carnegie paper is that um, it's it's really important for us to think about what are those threats that impact national security. Um, and this is another uh, reason I wanted to join Deborah Coates' as organization is they're, they're instrumental in reaching out to a number of critical infrastructure sectors and right now, if you think about the focus of disinformation really being on election, election is one of those many uh, sectors, if you will. Uh, but there are so many others that could be impacted in a negative way by disinformation that would pose a threat to our national security. And so, again, without a taxonomy to really classify those threats and, and do some sort of risk assessment, um, it becomes exceedingly difficult to to really put your, your arms around where you should focus. Right. So a big discussion point these days is the role of social media. It's a, 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 a new phenomenon that is being overlaid into our old brains. So you know, humans, humans have not evolved much in the last 10,000 years, but we have these new technological platforms, which unbeknownst to us, maybe 10 years ago, it appears that they are uh, quite uh, quite good at targeting parts of our brains which are having impacts that we could not have foreseen 10 years ago and now here we are with these social media platforms you know creating problems that now need to be managed uh, how are you guys thinking about how social media fits into your desires going forward to create a whole of society mitigation response uh, yeah so so it's a great question um, I think about the number of stakeholders that um, uh, would need to be involved in this whole of society approach, uh, social media platforms being being um, obviously one of them. Um, one of the ways that I think about the problem that I uh, that, that makes it different from cybersecurity is uh, this notion that in cybersecurity and members that belong to cybersecurity focused ISACs um, do so because of the collective security they get as they share the threat intelligence about the attempted cyber attacks on their own cyber infrastructure. Um, as they share that information, that helps them protect themselves better. And that's a bit of an analogy that to some degree breaks down in the world of disinformation. And you think about the social media platforms as maybe being the enablers of that kind of threat because of, that's where the narratives propagate. And so, so it's very, very important to to have the social media platforms engaged. Um, and, you know, I think right now, if we think back on what's happened over the last year, I'm very encouraged that um, of the progress that's been made. Uh, I think, uh, you know, given what's happened with, uh, you know, the COVID-19 and, and the information and disinformation around that, if you th obviously elections continues to be an issue, um, there are more and more issues that are now um, being presented where both the, the platforms and the public are becoming more aware of what, what disinformation can do and what that threat means. Right. So in your paper, you also mentioned the 2020 NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, and the call for social media, for a, a social media data analytics center. Uh, could you Tell a little bit more about your thoughts along those lines. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, so again, we are we are created more um, in the in the spirit of putting together a public 
private partnership. Um, and we noted that about a year ago, there was a call uh, for the government to, to carve out um, uh, such an organization. They noted that it should be a nonprofit organization. And the, um, the baton was handed to ODNI to create that center. Um, I'm very encouraged that we have lawmakers that are forward leaning and they're thinking about ODNI this way. ODNI for our audience is the uh, uh, director of national intelligence, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, so, so again, I'm encouraged that uh, that we have lawmakers that are forward leaning and looking looking in that direction and understand the benefit of that kind of organization being a nonprofit to to, to build that relationship between private industry and, and their their organizations. Um, I have to say, I'm not aware of any efforts in 2020 um, to advance that. Uh, uh, but that said, of course, it's been a crazy year with with COVID-19, which happened largely after that call was established. Um, and when I think back to the way the ISACs were formed in the critical infrastructure industries, you know, it took, uh, it took several years. Um, and I think, you know, uh, building that relationship between private industry and government, building that trust, understanding what that partnership looks like, it does take time. Um, and I suspect the journey will be very similar for cognitive security. Uh, but that said, I think it's very important that we keep these kind of conversations alive right now. Um, and I'd be very interested in engaging with anybody in, um, in, in the government space who is trying to promote uh, the creation of that kind of center. Yeah, outstanding. Well, we, we will have links to these materials in the show notes as well as a way for uh, our audience to get a hold of you. So you and your colleagues are embarked on a very ambitious agenda. I'm curious, you know, so what does the next year or a couple of years look like for the Cognitive Security Intelligence Center? Well, very good. Yeah. So we are really just launching right now. And um, you know, as I mentioned, our operational model is based entirely on collaboration, um, collaboration with a wide number of stakeholders. And we are reaching out to to those stakeholders right now, we're building those relationships. Um, we're talking to heads of industries and critical infrastructure sectors. We're reaching out to the online media platforms. Um, and we're also reaching out to some of the research organizations and academia. Um, our initial focus is going to be on establishing our advisory council. Again, given the collaborative nature of what we're doing, uh, we really wanna make this uh, a community driven approach. Um, we have several ideas how to build out our current existing capabilities to operationalize cognitive security, but we know that it will be critical to leverage our advisory council and its members um, to help us set near-term priorities and really to drive that community adoption. Uh, we're, we're by no means building a collaborative, uh, pardon me, exclusive community. Uh, I've reached out to several stakeholders, as I mentioned, uh, but it's it's a large and growing landscape and I, I certainly could have missed some some, some folks. Um, if any people listening here would like to be uh, a participant, they'd like to partner with us, I really encourage them to reach out to me. Well, absolutely. Your, your project aligns very well with uh, the kinds of things the Information Professionals Association is doing as well. So we are uh, you know, fellow travelers along this road of cognitive security and um, we wish you and your colleagues Godspeed as you continue down this path. And with that, my guest today on the Cognitive Crucible has been Stephen Bradley. Stephen, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, John. Appreciate the effort. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.